everyone. It's uh, great uh, to be with you. I wish I could say it's great to, to see you, but obviously I can't see you, but I'm uh, grateful for the avenue that we have to share uh, during this unusual time uh, as we're unable to meet as a church family. Uh, I'm sharing through a different format today, uh, recording on YouTube, and then that will be posted later uh, for your access uh, later today. Uh, this is a little bit of a test to see how the YouTube uh, format works. I thank Vicki Mason for her work on this and so many other things. Uh, please be praying for her as she has to deal with my lack of uh, technology understanding. She's very patient with me and I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, it is Wednesday. Uh, many of us would normally be meeting in some kind of a group. Uh, on Wednesday evening, we have other groups that meet at different times during the week, uh, but we can't gather together now in those groups, and so for now, this is what we can do, and uh, I'm so glad that we can connect uh, in this way together. I want to thank you so much for your feedback uh, from our time together on Sunday morning. Uh, it was such an encouragement to know how many from our church family uh, was connected uh, it was also a great encouragement to know how uh, so many from outside of our church family was connected. And that had a lot to do with uh, many of you sharing uh, this on Facebook with others. And so there was a great response and uh, greatly appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I want to encourage you to keep up with emails that I'm sending relating ministry plans while we're unable to meet together as a church family. Uh, I will send some reminders tomorrow on Thursday uh, regarding this Sunday morning. I also want to encourage parents and youth to support uh, what Ben will be doing with uh, youth ministry during this time. Uh, I know he is sending some emails uh, relating some plans. I know there's something uh, planned for Thursday evening and some other plans that he will relate as well. And so I just encourage you to encourage your youth to connect uh, with those opportunities. Our time together in this way will be uh, more brief than what we share together on Sunday morning. I'm just going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. I'm going to share with you a, a brief lesson slash devotion, and then I'll share some brief closing comments. So again, thank you for letting me share in this way with all of you. Uh, let's pray together, and then we'll uh, study the scriptures together. Uh, Father, I want to thank you so much for the avenue that we have to be able to share during this time. Uh, thank you for the technology that's available to be able to keep us all connected. Thank you to, uh, for your alertness to everyone in our church family, uh, to others who may be uh, watching this later. I want to thank you for each person, and I want to thank you for your love and grace to all of us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And during this unusual time, I pray that we'll grow together in our love for one another, and, uh, and most of all, in our love for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to do this evening, our time together uh, today in the scriptures, this would be similar to what I would do with community group leaders or what I provide for community group leaders uh, on a weekly basis to share with their groups. Uh, this is what I do in the groups that I lead. I provide lessons for some of the community group leaders and that's what I utilize as well in my Lyft community group and the college and career group uh, that I lead on Wednesday evenings. So what we do in that format is use the Sunday sermon uh, as a basis for the lesson. This isn't to rehearse the sermon. It's to actually just kind of review some of the main points and to focus more on the application of the sermon. Of course, it would be best if you listen to the sermon first, uh, but if you were unable to do that, you could still benefit even if you didn't have uh, that opportunity. So our lesson, our devotion lesson this evening, or today I should say, should, will be based on the Sunday sermon from Genesis 35, verses 1 through 15. And again, uh, this was the final study to be shared in the series uh, Isaac and Jacob. And so our approach in this setting will be this. It'll be different because normally in our groups we would be interacting 
and so we can't be together to interact so what I'll do is read the passage uh, we will have uh, four discussion points uh, based on the four reminders about worship that I shared with uh, with all of you through the sermon on Sunday morning and then for each discussion point I'll make a quick comment uh, or summary of the scripture upon which the discussion point was based and then I'll share with you one or two discussion questions for each discussion point and the goal is to lead us to more practical application than I was able to offer in the sermon so since we can't interact with the questions I will offer suggested responses uh, but I'll also ask you to consider your own responses to the questions uh, and perhaps uh, discuss them later as a couple or or as a family you may even want to write the questions down so that you can have some further discussion about this uh, in a group in your family or perhaps even uh, reflect on this further as an individual so again this will be more of a devotional time rather than a discussion so Genesis 35 just a quick review of the context uh, Jacob uh, has been back in the land of Canaan approximately 10 years. Uh, he's living north in the land of promise near a place called Shechem, a very pagan place, very near a pagan Canaanite city. And, and so in chapter 34, as a result of Jacob moving to this place, uh, this resulted in some serious problems for his family. His family was really uh, in a mess at this point in time. And uh, his worship, it would seem, would, be, uh, would have been stagnant and his family life, his individual life, perhaps being impacted by the Canaanite culture uh, surrounding them. So with that in mind, God in his grace, his amazing grace uh, to Jacob, called him and moved him to a place called Bethel, a place that was familiar to Jacob. And he moved him there for the purpose of giving him opportunity uh, for greater worship. And so I'm going to read the passage again just to uh, refresh our memories about what the passage was about. Uh, and then I'll give some summary as we share each discussion point. And again, my goal isn't to rehearse the sermon. I'm certainly not going to go into details, but I'll just give you some quick summaries. So in reading the passage in Genesis 35, we're told, Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother and Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him put away the foreign gods that are among you purify yourselves and change your garments and then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, oak tree, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there, and he called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree, so the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. And this is a little historical insertion. Uh, to remind us of the transition in the patriarchal narrative from Isaac to Jacob. Verse 9 tells us, Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and the king shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. 
And then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So from the sermon on Sunday, we noted four reminders about worship. Uh, from Jacob's interaction with God, God's interaction with Jacob. And so those four reminders uh, will serve as our four discussion points. And so again, we're going to focus on the discussion points and try to make a little bit more application with each of those. So the discussion point number one, uh, and this is from the Sunday sermon, our worship is to be growing. We noted that from verse one, where God called Jacob to go to Bethel to build an altar. Uh, Bethel was a special place where Jacob had had a significant encounter with God some 30 years earlier. And so God is moving Jacob from Shechem where things weren't going so well, uh, more than likely his worship was stagnant, and moving him to Bethel to a place where God in his grace could put Jacob in position to grow more in his worship. And so the main point is this, God wasn't allowing Jacob to settle for the way things were in Shechem. He is moving him, he is giving him opportunity to grow in his worship. And so that's our focus there. So the question for us, and if we were together in a group, we could discuss this, but I still want to ask the question, why should we be growing in our worship? We have declared that from verse 1, so let's ask the practical question, why? Why should we be growing in our worship? Well, let's start with the fact that that's what God expects. You know, God is not okay with complacency in worship. Uh, he's not okay with stagnation in worship. God expects, he's God, he expects and he deserves great worship. Uh, he deserves and expects you and me to give him our best in worship. The fact is God wants us to give him all of our worship. He wants to, us to give him uh, the very best. Uh, so this means worship should be growing. You know, the Christian life in every regard is designed for growth, not for stagnation, not for complacency, but we should be growing in all aspects, and that includes in our worship. And so let's keep that in mind. Uh, another reason that we should be growing in worship is the fact that it's simply a privilege. It is a privilege to know the one true God, to know that he knows us through his son Jesus, and it is a privilege to get to know him and to worship him as deeply and as intimately as possible. So that's another reason. Another reason is the fact that we benefit. When you and I really begin to grow in worship, we benefit from that. Growing worship builds faith. Uh, it builds trust. It uh, gives us fuel uh, for victorious Christian living. You know, it enables us to live victoriously in challenging circumstances like we're finding ourselves today as we, you know, face this coronavirus and all of the challenges that are associated with that. And it gives us the fuel and ability to live victoriously for the other challenges that uh, many uh, may be facing, many of you may be facing. All of us are being challenged by this coronavirus issue, but many of you are also uh, struggling and facing many other different challenges. And as we grow in our worship, that will enable us to face those challenges more victoriously. So question number two, question number one is why. Question number two is how can we be growing in our worship right now? Let's really think about that. Now, how can we be growing in our worship right now as we go through this unusual time with the coronavirus and also with the other challenges that currently surround some of our lives. So how can we be growing? Well, number one, let's recognize we have an opportunity. Let's recognize the fact that God is giving us an opportunity right now. You know, God is a God who doesn't waste any 
opportunity for us to draw closer to him in our worship and in our trust. And what an opportunity he's giving us right now. Yes, there's a lot of inconvenience and certainly some uncertainty, but in all of that, God is giving you and me an opportunity to draw near to him and to worship him more deeply. Another way that we can uh, be growing in our worship right now in this unusual time is to use the change in some of our schedules uh, to, in order to grow our worship. In a lot of cases, school being out, other activities being diminished, uh, some distractions from schedules have been eliminated. And so God's giving us an opportunity to spend more time in his word, you know, to spend more time in prayer, uh, to spend more time as a family in the word together, uh, in prayer together. Uh, what a great time it would be for husbands and fathers and perhaps single mothers who are the shepherds of their home to grow in that leadership as the shepherd, as the shepherd leader, uh, leading your family to grow in worship, spending more time together in worship. So those are some ways that I can think of. I'm sure you can think of some ways, and I would encourage you to note those and maybe discuss them uh, in the context of your family. So here are two questions just for personal reflection. And we like to be real with this. We like to be real with the application. We want to be just hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. So let's use these questions to reflect not on somebody else's life, but on our own lives. Question number one is your my worship growing or has it become stagnant? Let's really be honest about that evaluation. Question number two, what immediate step can you take to help your worship to be growing right now? You know, really think about that. Think about how your worship can be growing, a step that you can take. Uh, think about it, maybe write that down and begin to take that step immediately. And maybe you want to share uh, that step with someone else in the context of your family. So discussion point number two. Number one, our worship is to be growing. Discussion point number two, our worship is expected to be pure. Uh, let's focus on verses two through four in the way of summary. That's how we have developed this discussion point. As in verses 2 through 4, Jacob instructed his people before they went up to Bethel to get rid of, to put away, foreign gods, uh, to purify themselves, uh, to change their garments. I'm not going to go into details of all that again as I did in the sermon, but this is all about Jacob getting himself and his people ready for more pure worship. Jacob shared with his people, uh, about going up to Bethel after he admonished them to prepare and that there he was going to build an altar of worship. And so Jacob's people responded. They gave him the foreign gods and he hid them, meaning he buried them out of sight forever. So this is all about getting ready for more pure worship. So let's discuss. Let's ask this question. Again, you might want to write this down and discuss it uh, in the context of your family. Uh, why is purity in worship important? Let's really think about that. And the answer, or one response could be, is the fact that God is perfectly holy. And because God is perfectly holy, he expects his people to worship him in holiness. I shared on Sunday morning a quote from Psalm 24. You know, who may ascend into, into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand, you know, in his holy place? The answer is those who have clean hands and a pure heart. And so as we approach God in worship, he expects us to approach him in purity. You see, we can't come to God in worship with known sin in our lives, with some kind of idolatry in our lives, and expect him to be pleased with that and expect him to accept it as worship. So God is serious about holiness in our worship because he is holy. And, and because of that, we are to consistently 
acknowledge our sin and forsake our sin as we approach him in worship. Purity and worship is important. So let's think about, think about it from a practical standpoint. What are some things that we may need to get rid of or to put away in order to give the Lord the pure worship that he expects and he deserves? Now, we should really think about that question because it may be a lot more than what we even realize. You know, it may be a lot of things in our lives that we find acceptable that he doesn't. You know, some sin that we're holding on to, uh, an attitude that doesn't line up with his character, you know, some kind of improper relationship, maybe some sort of immoral act or actions, or maybe even idolatry. Idolatry defined could be anything that we are choosing to put ahead of the Lord. So these may be some things that we need to put away. And so for personal reflection, what do you, what do I need to get rid of so that you, so that I can give the Lord the pure worship he deserves and he expects? And so as we consider that, this is what our response should be. We should give it up, whatever it is, and bury it today and be committed to giving the worship, the, the Lord, the pure worship that he wants and deserves. Discussion point number three. Our worship is to be growing. Our worship is to be pure. Our worship is to remember and celebrate the awesomeness of God. And this focus comes from verses five through seven, where I summarize reminding us that Jacob and his people journeyed up to Bethel after they purified themselves. As they did, God's awesome presence was with them in protecting them from the Canaanite people around them. And so God's awesome presence was with them and God's awesome protection surrounded them. And ultimately, Jacob arrived in Bethel and in response to the awesomeness of God, Jacob immediately built an altar to the Lord. Uh, in response to what God had instructed him to do, in response to God's awesome presence on the journey, and also, I believe, in response to a very awesome encounter that Jacob had with God in this very same place some 30 years earlier. So that's a summary of the text. So let's think about that for you and me. What does it mean? to remember and to celebrate the awesomeness of God in our worship. You know, it's one thing to say that we should do that. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, let's think about how we act and how we celebrate other things in our lives uh, that are meaningful to us. You know, generally there's a lot of enthusiasm attached to that. Generally there's a lot of joy attached to that. So I think those are some things that would be present. I think also there would be an awful lot of thanksgiving. I think thanksgiving would be, you know, more naturally flowing from our lives if we were truly reflecting on and remembering the awesomeness of God in our worship. And I would also say that praise will come easy. You know, when we are, when we are really remembering the awesomeness of God and celebrating that, it's going to be easy for us to praise him. It's going to be easy for us to say things to God about himself that are declaring our adoration of him. And I think it'll be easy for us to tell others that as well, to share with other people what we think about the greatness and the awesomeness of God. So let's think about it also like this. What are some ways that God has been and continues to be awesome on our behalf because he has been and he continues to be well right now in, in spite of what's going on around us he is powerfully present in each of our lives uh, if we have a relationship with him through Jesus not only that he is constantly alert to our lives as if you and I were the only one who exist and in the Lord Jesus Christ God has given you and me, every spiritual blessing. That's what Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 1. So in other words, we have all that we need 
available to us in order to maximize our relationship with God through Christ. So I think those are some definite ways in which God uh, has been and continues to be awesome uh, on our behalf. And I'm sure that you could think of some others as well. So here's the question for personal reflection. Are you currently really remembering the awesomeness of God and celebrating the awesomeness of God in your worship? You know, if not, let's just be honest about that. And if not, this is really a great time to start, uh, to not be defeated by life and circumstances, but to begin to give God awesome worship as we reflect on him and his awesome presence and his awesome power uh, in our lives. Discussion point number four. Uh, our worship is to be growing. Our worship is to be pure. Our worship uh, is to re remember the awesomeness of God and celebrate the awesomeness of God in our lives. Number four, it is also to remember and celebrate the greatness of God's grace. So we'll develop that focus from verses 9 through 15. God demonstrated great grace to Jacob throughout his life. And in this passage, I mean, in this passage, you have God coming down to Jacob in some kind of physical appearance, as he also did in chapter 32. Uh, in this context, he is giving Jacob more blessing. He is reminding Jacob of his new name, Israel. He has declared to Jacob that he is almighty God, to him. He has reminded him of great promises regarding the fact that he would become a great nation, that nations would come through him, kings would come from him, and ultimately his descendants would possess the land that God was giving to him and his descendants. And so Jacob responded to all that grace in this encounter in verses 9 through 15. Uh, he erected a pillar of stone called a standing stone. This was a memorial to this encounter with God. He's giving him worship. And in addition to that, uh, he poured oil on the stone. He poured a drink offering on the stone. He is setting this place apart as a place of worship because of God's grace to him. And he also confirmed the name of this place as being Bethel, meaning house of God. Jacob named that place that some 30 years earlier. He is reaffirming the name of this place and declaring it as a place of worship. So let's think about it in regard to us. What are some ways that God has demonstrated the greatness of his grace to us that are very similar to Jacob? Here are a few ways. I hope you can think of some ways as well. Uh, like Jacob and God has given you and me a new identity. He has changed our name from sinner to saint when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Saint is our identity, meaning that we have become a holy one set apart unto God. Number two, like Jacob, God is God Almighty to us. He is with us. Uh, he is fighting for us. He is striving for us. He is our power. He is our strength. Number three, like Jacob, God has given you and me so many incredible promises. Promises that we can claim right now in the face of uncertainty. Uh, we, promises that we can claim with total certainty in these uncertain times, in this unusual time. Promises that we can enjoy today, uh, even though our lives are kind of disrupted and surrounded by some trouble in regard to the coronavirus and some of the other challenges that we're facing in life. We can enjoy and we can claim his promises. So here's for your personal reflection. In the midst of this uh, coronavirus concern and the other concerns that you may have in your life, how is God demonstrating his grace to you? I shared with you some ways. Uh, I would like to encourage you to think of some other ways and maybe note those, maybe share those. Uh, Jacob also set up a standing stone as a worship response to God's great grace. I like that action. I like that example. 
What can you do? Or what can you give to God in worship as an expression of gratitude for his great grace to you? Think of something and make a commitment uh, to take that action, whatever it may be, uh, right away. So that's, that's our focus. That's our uh, devotion for this evening. We just simply reviewed four reminders regarding our worship, and then how we can apply those more practically uh, in our lives. And I hope that the, the practical suggestions have been helpful, and I hope that you'll meditate on these further and, uh, and share them together in the context of your family. So I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to share with you today in this way. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's been encouraging. This is probably what we'll continue to do if we're unable to, to meet in our groups and in other ways in the coming uh, days and, and certainly probably for the next couple weeks. So here's what I'd like for you to do. As you have responded uh, to this this evening, or excuse me, today in regard to this lesson, this devotion, if you would like to, I would encourage you to text me any personal response that you would like to make to what's been shared in these reminders. Maybe an example to follow, maybe a specific step to take, uh, maybe a change to make, some other, some other step or action that you would like to take as a, as a result of this time together in the scriptures. And again, I would encourage you to maybe share this with someone in the church family, uh, someone in your community group that you normally meet with regarding the application uh, that you plan to make. So again, I want to thank you for the time together. I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to share just very quickly some reminders uh, for the rest of the week for from a ministry standpoint. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you again so much for this passage of Scripture as we have seen your great and awesome work in Jacob's life. And even though he was not doing well in Shechem, Thank you that your grace was with him. You took him up to Bethel, and he made a good and proper response and gave you the kind of worship that you deserve and that you expect. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to challenge uh, your people who have connected with this passage of Scripture to continue to grow in worship and purity and, and also in celebration of your awesomeness and celebration of your grace. Thank you for your great goodness to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you're with all of us in this unusual and challenging time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a few closing comments regarding the days going ahead of us. Uh, I'll send reminders for Sunday, uh, sometime on Thursday. I want to encourage you to be alert to what Ben is planning and communicating with his youth group. Uh, also, I want to encourage you to continue staying in touch with one another, praying and caring for one another. I've heard about a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that in the last uh, couple weeks or so, and so please continue to do that. Uh, please let me know if you have any concerns or care needs that need to be shared. Uh, I want to encourage all of us to continue trusting our sovereign God during this unusual time, uh, inviting him to grow our relationship with him as he's giving us that opportunity. Also encourage us to continue being a light to the world around us. Uh, the world right now needs to see the reality of our worship. The world needs to see the reality of our witness. And so I close by reminding us of the psalm that I've shared on many occasions recently uh, in Psalm 94, where the psalmist said, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. And so with that, and that reminder, grace and peace to all of you. Love and appreciate you. God bless. Thank you.